Full disclosure, I really struggled putting together a title for today's talk. So I had to ask my wife for help. Fortunately for me, she's an award-winning novelist, and it took her all of three seconds to say, you need a title? I got your title. This is your title. <laughs> I had the same reaction. I loved it. But it worried me a little bit. After all, this is a TED Talk. So I thought I'd soften it a bit and maybe go with this one. But I was still concerned. Uh, so in the end, I settled on this last one. Now, the interesting thing about these titles is that none of the words presented are overtly vulgar or profane. But if you're like me, you filled in this missing information with a word that could be considered taboo. Now, cognitive psychologists, many of them, study this generation process. How do we go about filling in this missing information? But I'm actually interested in the next step. Once we've generated something, how does that influence our later memory? Researchers have explored the effect of generation on memory in the lab since the late 1970s, typically using a procedure like this. A participant comes into the lab and they're asked to read a long list of words, maybe 20 or 30 words, that resemble this. Some of the words are presented in their full intact form, so participants simply need to read them aloud as they see them. Others are presented as word fragments with one letter missing. Before participants can re read these aloud, they have to fill in the missing letter. But this tends to be trivially easy. In fact, we could demonstrate it right now, but I, I need your help. What is the second word? Village. Village. Fourth word? Anchor. Last word? Yeah. Fantastic. Despite the relative ease of reading and generating these words, participants tend to remember significantly more of the fragmented or generated words compared to the intact or read words. The simple act of filling in a missing letter can boost your memory by 10 to 30 percent, depending on the conditions in the study. So why does this happen? Well, it seems that generation encourages more semantic or meaning-based processing during encoding, which then leads to additional roots for you to retrieve later on at test. Now, if you're like most of my students, you're probably thinking, this is interesting, but it all seems rather artificial. Right? After all, talk titles typically don't contain missing words, and you rarely run into word fragments in your daily lives. I guess unless you're a fan of crossword puzzles. So for the rest of today, I want to share with you some research uh, from my lab and from my classroom that explores two real-world applications of the generation effect. And we're going to start with an interesting project on lyrical censorship and memory. You've most likely experienced lyrical censorship to the radio. You've been there listening, and then you notice that some of the lyrics, some of the artist's words, have been omitted or obscured in some way. Regardless of the method, the logic and the intent is clear. If you can't hear the word, then you can't process the word. Censorship is an attempt to limit your processing. Just a couple of minutes ago, I showed you how easy it is for us to generate missing information. Wouldn't it be ironic, then, if the simple act of censoring an item actually made that item more memorable? When I made this connection, I set out to design a series of experiments to explore whether we would see a generation effect in the context of lyrical censorship. Now, I only have time to describe a portion of one experiment today, but please know that the data are representative of the entire program of research. So the first big decision I had to make in this research project was, what kind of information should I censor? Initially, I thought I'd use traditionally censored materials, curse words, drug references, things of that nature. 
But I was concerned that this information came from too small of a set. It's too well known. It might be too easy for the participants to generate. And in fact, this might be a class of words that are inherently more memorable. So instead, I decided to censor common nouns from a song. I thought this would be a more difficult task for participants, much more challenging. Also, I figured this is a much larger and unknown set of material. Plus, if I use nouns, we have these things called normative data. So I could ensure that all of the words were equally memorable at the outset of the experiment. So I wouldn't have to worry about that. So with the materials in mind, I chose a set of 30 common nouns, words like father and chair, and I wrote a song around them. Now you're probably thinking, why did he go through the trouble of writing his own song? I mean, songs exist in the world. Well, you see, I needed to equate song familiarity across my participants, which were college students. So I couldn't use anything too familiar. I suppose I could have chosen an obscure song, an obscure band, but you know anything about college students? Listening to obscure bands is kind of what they do, so I thought I would be better off just designing my own experiment, designing my own song. So with the song in hand, I decided to manipulate censorship in two different ways. Uh, some of the participants heard partially censored information in which the initial speech sound was still audible. You can kind of think of this as a sloppy version of censorship, which actually qu occurs quite a bit on the radio. The other participants heard completely censored lyrics, so all of the speech sounds were gone. Now, I wanted to give you a sense of what this sounded like, so I'm going to play the first line of the song two different ways. And we're going to start with the partially censored version. So just listen along. It should be obvious when the word is censored. Is anyone able to figure out the identity of that missing word? Memory. memory, fantastic, well done. Let me take you on a trip down memory lane. Here's what it sounded like in the completely censored version. Let me take you on a trip down lane. So all the sounds were gone there. After hearing the song, I gave, I gave participants a recognition memory test. They would see a word on the screen, and they had to decide whether that word was in the song or not. In all, there were 60 words in this recognition test, so 60 separate decisions. 15 of the words had actually been heard, 15 were censored from the song, and then there were 30 nouns that didn't appear in the song at all. They were distractor items. So what did we find? Well, first, let me orient you to the graph here. On the y-axis, we have percentage correct, going from 0 to 100. And on the x-axis, we have the two different types of censorship, partial and complete. We'll begin with the heard words. Right? These were words that were actually sung in the song, that actually went into their ears. You can see they recognize these words rather well, 65% and 61% accuracy for those two conditions. But now let's move to the interesting condition, the censored words. Remember, these are words that we never heard in the song, words that were either partially or completely omitted. Intuitively, you might think, we should have 0% accuracy. How can we remember something that wasn't even presented? But based on the generation effect, we're actually predicting something in the opposite direction. We actually think that the generated words might be remembered better than things they actually heard. That's exactly what we found. 88% and 80% accuracy for those two conditions, respectively. Ironically, lyrical censorship enhanced memory by 23% and 21% for censored words. These were statistically significant differences. Now, although these results are impressive, Please remember, this was with college students. Are college students the target audience for censorship? Who's the target audience? Kids, children, right? Children are the target audience. Now, no one has yet run this experiment, but I predict 
that censorship will be effective for kids, especially very young children, because they're not particularly good at generating information yet. These are skills that develop with time and experience. Plus, they might not even yet know the identities of those censored words. How can you generate something if you don't even know the word to begin with? However, lyrical censorship will become less and less effective over time as the kids age and as they gain more experience. Now, so far, the generation effect probably seems like something that happens to us, right? It seems like it's this automatic process that occurs without our conscious intent or conscious awareness. So this begs the question, can we be more deliberate about this? Can we actively use generation to enhance our memory? If we think a bit more broadly about what it means to generate information, then we can easily apply this to educational settings. For years in my courses, I've encouraged students to take advantage of the generation effect as they study for exams. I'd suggest that they generate definitions and examples on their own instead of trying to memorize those provided in the book. Or I'd suggest that they omit certain keywords in their notes. So when they're looking at it over it again, they have to fill in that, gen that, that missing information and generate that information. Surprisingly, students never listen to me. and <laughs> They never take this advice. And I don't understand it, but I also kind of do understand it. Right? These are successful college students. They have spent a lifetime developing a set of effective study strategies and they're reluctant to try something new this late in their career. So if you're a professor like me and you want to get your students to try something new, what can you do? Well, the solution is actually pretty simple. You just assign it as homework. Uh, <laughs> and this is what I did in a couple of recent classes. I instituted a new semester-long project in which they had to generate one multiple choice question for each of eight chapters across the term. Then at the end of the semester, I was interested in whether this generation activity influenced their performance on the exams. So for each student, I went back to see if there were any topics that they wrote about that overlapped with the topics that I tested on. That is, if a student wrote a question on topic X, and then later on there happened to be an exam question on topic X, how did they fare on that exam question? So I compared performance in that situation to overall baseline performance. How did they fare on all of the non-generated material? As you can see here, performance in the baseline or control condition was 76%. Not surprisingly, given what we know about the generation effect, students fared much better with the generated content. By creating a multiple choice question on a topic, they were able to improve their performance on that topic by almost two full letter grades. Presumably, the act of creating these questions encouraged more semantic processing. The students had to think more deeply about the content, and that subsequently enhanced their memories. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that this only works for a multiple choice. Although I don't have data on this yet, the logic should hold for other types of tests as well, whether it be short answer or essay. So long as the generation process is appropriate for the kind of test that you're taking. That is, if you know you have a short answer question coming up, you should probably spend time generating and answering short answer questions. You want to make sure that the kind of thinking that you're doing during study is appropriate for the kind of thinking that you're going to be asked to do at test. By now, I hope I have convinced you of the simple power of the generation effect. But if there are still some skeptics in the audience, I'd like to end by asking you one final question. What were the three talk titles from my opening slide? You might remember that they were all questions. 
You might not remember the exact construction of the questions, but I'm pretty sure you'll remember these three items and whatever you generated for them. Thank you for your time.